I've never shared this story in public before. I want to thank David for inviting me tonight. I was 37 years old. I was a fully trained, board certified cardiothoracic surgeon. I was at the absolute top of the surgical food chain. I could call patients out of life and death situations. I lived life in the extremes. The absolute elation of saving a human life and the abyss of knowing that someone died at your own hands. You know, I stopped and started the human heart every day. I was invincible, or so I thought. I could operate for 36 straight hours and not even break a sweat. <coughs> See, that's how we're trained. There's no room for error. And we watch our surgical mentors and they teach us the intricacies and precision of heart surgery, but there's not a lot of room for bedside manner education. I was coming off a uh, surgical marathon run, and I got to use the very inviting bathroom. Even using the bathroom for a couple minutes and relaxing was heaven. I looked down in the toilet, and there was some blood and mucus. And, you know, I had some hemorrhoids in the past, but I had some blood on my toilet paper and things like that, but never anything like that before. So what does a good old American heart surgeon do? He rationalizes it and goes about his business of saving lives. That was, for months, I was able to go on like that until one day I did the one thing that is completely and utterly unforgivable in a marriage. I forgot to flush. <laughs> Whoops. Is that blood in the toilet? Are you bleeding? Ah, it's nothing big. No, it's nothing to worry about. No, it's no problem. Just, just some hemorrhoids. Well, that got me through about two days. And probably some internet searches later. And uh, she just would not let go. So she made me promise to talk to one of my gastroenterology colleagues who I worked with every day. And the next time I saw Justin in the hospital, now I told him the story about the time course of the bloody poop in question. And I fully expected him to realize that I was, of course, invincible, and that this was not a big deal. And instead, he scheduled me for a colonoscopy. So Lancaster, Pennsylvania was a small town, so I sort of sculpted my way into the GI office, hoping not to be recognized. And Someone behind the counter said, Mr. Thompson, you're up. Now, I knew I was incognito because once you go to medical school, you drop the Mr. tag. You're never a Mr. again. You're either Rick or a doctor. So I was doing pretty good. I was still in, you know, incognito here in a GI office waiting to get a colonoscopy. Next thing you know, I was asleep. And uh, I woke up to my friend, Justin, who was not his usual, usual jovial self. Rick, you have a two centimeter sessile polyp at 12 centimeters. I had to kind of channel back to the days when I used to do bowel surgery, which was a long time before that, and that wasn't good. He said there's a 50-50 chance that you have cancer. So I'm a gambler. I was okay with those odds. I went home and I sat on the couch and watched Sports Center and fell asleep. And Jen went out and ran some errands, and uh, I didn't think twice about it. About two hours later, I woke up to the worst abdominal pain I have ever had. It was shaking chills, a fever to 103, and I called Jen up and I said, we have to go back to the hospital. And I wasn't feeling very invincible. So we went into the doctor's entrance of the hospital where I practiced, and of course we walked in, I kind of hobbled in, and the first person we saw was a general surgeon that I knew. And I asked the question, are you on call for general surgery? And fear went over his face, because I've been asked that question a thousand times before, and it is never good when you're asked that question, when you're a surgeon. He told me to meet him down in the ER, so I 
proceeded to hobble down to the emergency department, which was clear across the hospital because I was too proud to take a wheelchair. And my Jen said, you need a wheelchair. <laughs> so a couple tests later, and they told me something that I already knew. I had perforated colon. So I was about to be on the receiving end of cold, sharp, surgical steel. Wait a second. I'm the doctor, I'm the fixer, I'm the surgeon, I'm not the patient. And wait a second, do I have cancer or don't I? I, I didn't even know at that point. And the operation for both is like completely different. One's just putting a stitch in a hole and the other one's a huge operation. So I told the general surgeon, I said, look, I don't know what to do, but why don't you do a cancer operation on it? You know, it may be cancer. So he obliged and said, we'll do. And I slipped into a propofol-induced coma, kind of like Michael Jackson. But I came out of mine. And uh, I came out of my surgery face-to-face -face with a pathologist. Now, I want to set the scene for you here because I have never in my medical career seen a pathologist come to the recovery room, ever, 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 ever. They kind of sit behind the desk and look at slides all day. The pathologist was there, and he told me, Rick, your tumor was malignant. You have cancer. And then that fog that rolls over every person who's ever been told that diagnosis rolled over me. From that point forward, my life was going to be measured in five year survival rates. When I would walk into a room, people would say, that's, that's Dr. Thompson, the heart surgeon. That night, I went up to uh, a regular floor bed. The nurse in the recovery room tried to keep me away from my usual stomping grounds in the hospital, and she parked me on a neurology floor. Now, if you know anything about hospitals, if you've just had surgery, you do not want to be on a neurology floor. And it was July. And July, unfortunately, in hospitals is also not a very good month to be a patient, because all the freshly minted nurses, freshly minted medical students, and interns are practicing in July, and they're all very green. So my first night in the neurology floor, I had a nurse who, the cute, bubbly blonde, but she was completely clueless. I had absolutely no idea how to take care of me. And that night was like a Vietnamese prison camp. It was pure torture. The beeping was endless. It was incessant. The squeezy boots on your legs going off every two minutes. The pain pump that somebody put in me was clicking every minute. Then there was monitors going off. And then, of course, the regular pain on top of that. And then the bladder spasms from the ureteral stents that I had placed. If my patients had to go through this, this was terrible. This was awful. Well, the next morning, help arrived. The quintessential nurse <gasps> ratchet came in the room. <laughs> Dr. Thompson, I know who you are. This is not your operating room. You are my patient now, and you need to listen to me. <clears throat> I never thought being bossed around would feel so good. <laughs> Somebody who finally inspired some confidence and was going to take care of me. This was great. So, a couple days went by, and uh, you know my life was on a pathologist's desk. In cancer, the lymph nodes are the most important thing. And there was a pathologist looking at my lymph nodes on some desk in some office somewhere. It, it, it kind of made me think of the talking head song, Once in a Lifetime, like how did I get here? How did I get to the point in my life that everything I was and everything I ever would be would be based on a couple slides on some pathologist's desk? Well, what does a heart surgeon do when he has no control over the situation? He, of course, tries to take control of the situation. And I was impatient. So I tried calling a pathologist myself. And the phones in the patient rooms, I didn't realize it, can't call the doctors in the hospital <laughs> by design. <laughs> so I had a plan. 
I would go out to the nurse's station and I would make the call from there. The most important phone call in my life, so I had this plan. And I had a Foley catheter in. I had squeezy boots on my legs. I had a pain pump that I had to carry with me. And then I had an IV pole. And then I had a, of course, the quintessential hospital gown that doesn't cover your behind. <laughs> so I shuffle out to the nurse's station looking like I'm gonna take a walk. <laughs> and I know when the nurses are going to all scatter for their you know, duties for the day, and they, they scatter. So I go over and I grab a phone, quickly call, John, it's Rick Thompson. Do you have my pathology yet? Oh, Rick, hi! Hey, I'm looking at it right now. He sounded like he was taking took a happy pill or something. I mean, my, he was judge and jury of the rest of my life. And he was sounding like it was just like a big deal. Oh, I'll look at it right when I'm on the phone with you. So, oh, the first lymph node, oh, that looks good. Oh, the second lymph node, no cancer in there. He did that 15 times while I was on the phone with him. Looked at every node. Thank God, all of them were negative. And, uh, you know, I started crying like right out at the nurse's station. You know, I would have a chance to maybe see my kids graduate you know I've walked to the other side being a cancer patient has taught me more about medicine than anything in medical school residency surgical training it's a very special thing to be a cancer patient and what it's helped me to do is my journey from being I was a pretty caring doctor, but I was a fixer. I mean, I could fix things. And it helped me on the journey to become a healer. Because sometimes there are patients that I can't fix, but I can heal. You know, my wife jokes around with me and she says, uh, you know, some guys get a Porsche for their midlife crisis. You were lucky enough to get cancer. Well, I'm still waiting for my Porsche. <laughs>